Well, greetings, everyone. My name is David Phillips, and I'm the director of the program on peace building and human rights at Columbia University. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to today's discussion about preventing a second Armenian genocide. We've got a great panel. Uh, our discussion will start with a presentation from Senator Chris Van Hollen, who is a Democratic Senator from Maryland, member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, someone who is a great champion of human rights for Armenians, for Kurds, and for other people who are suffering tyranny. So let's uh, hear the statement from Senator Van Hollen, and then we'll go right to our live panelists. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent Maryland in the United States Senate. And I'm honored to be joining all of you at the Columbia University Institute for the Study of Human Rights and your community partners for today's important discussion. Today, we are witnessing the latest chapter in Azerbaijan's campaign of aggression against Nagorno-Karabakh. As Vladimir Putin continues his brutal war against the Ukrainian people, Azerbaijan has launched another campaign of aggression against the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. For over 50 days now, Azerbaijan has imposed a blockade on the region, cutting people off from deliveries of food, medicine, and other daily necessities. Among those stranded are 30,000 Armenian children, 20,000 Armenian elderly, and 9,000 Armenians with disabilities. We are witnessing a rising humanitarian crisis, and we cannot remain silent in the face of these malign actions. I have long said that we need to call out violence, aggression, and violations of basic human rights wherever we see them. For the United States to maintain credibility around the world, we must ensure accountability. In September, following earlier aggression committed by Azerbaijan against the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. I joined Senate colleagues in urging Secretary of Defense Austin and Secretary of State Blinken to stop providing U.S. security assistance to Azerbaijan. I have continued to call upon the Biden administration to help promote peace, and I was pleased to see Secretary Blinken urge an immediate reopening of the Lachin Corridor to commercial traffic when he met last month with the president of Azerbaijan. In addition, the State Department last week called for direct dialogue between the parties in this conflict. And while I certainly welcome dialogue, the United States must be prepared to do more. It must be prepared to take action to hold Azerbaijan accountable for this aggression. I will continue to monitor the situation closely and work with my colleagues to end the blockade and ensure that we do everything we can to advance the basic principles of justice, peace, and human rights. Now is the time to learn from our history to ensure that we do not repeat the darkest moments of our past and instead build a brighter and more peaceful future for all. It's in that spirit that I wanna thank all of you at Columbia University for hosting this crucial discussion and I look forward to partnering with you in the weeks, months, and years ahead as we work together to promote peace and human rights. Take care. Chris, thanks so much for that statement. And thanks for your wonderful work on behalf of human rights and giving voice to victims in Artsakh and elsewhere. Just to provide a little bit of historical context to our discussion, thousands of people died and hundreds of thousands were displaced during the Karabakh War of the 1990s. Russia brokered a ceasefire agreement in May 1994. This initiated a period which we'll call a frozen conflict mm. until April 2016. Then Azerbaijan launched an attack and armed conflict over 44 days resumed in 2020. Today's panel considers current conditions in Artsakh, as it's known to Armenians. Azerbaijan blockades the Lachin Corridor as we meet today. 
The corridor connects Artsakh to Armenia. The blockade is a flagrant violation of ceasefire terms and a violation of international humanitarian law. Azerbaijan disrupts access to essential goods and services, including food, fuel, and medication for 120,000 Armenians in Artsakh. This blockade affects the most vulnerable populations, the young and the aged. The humanitarian crisis is further aggravated by Azerbaijan's disruption of the natural gas supply to Artsakh, which has left houses, hospitals, and schools without heating. Internet and electricity supplies have also been interrupted. Essentially, this campaign is part of a systematic effort by Azerbaijan to make Artsakh unlivable and drive Armenians from their historic lands. These actions constitute a second Armenian genocide, thus the name of our panel today. The latest round of violent conflict started on April 2nd of 2020. Flush with money from oil and gas exports, Azerbaijan spent $4 billion buying weapons and it attacked on multiple fronts. Ilham Aliyev did not act alone. Turkey acted in solidarity with its Turkic brethren by deploying armed drones and F-16s provided by the United States. According to eyewitness accounts, Turkish troops and equipment fought on the front line near the Iranian border. Erdogan made his intentions clear. He vowed, Nagorno-Karabakh will be returned to, our, to Azerbaijan. We will support Azerbaijan until the end. After 44 days of bloodletting, Russia helped mediate a trilateral ceasefire on the 9th of November of 2020. The agreement requires Azerbaijan to guarantee freedom of movement along the Lachen Corridor, the only road connecting Artsakh to Armenia and the outside world. However, Azerbaijan has violated its ceasefire obligations, blockading the Lachen Corridor on December 12, 2022. Baku said so-called environmentalists from Azerbaijan were responsible. This claim is just a farce. There is no independent civil society in Azerbaijan. Facial recognition software matched photos of the protesters with members of Azerbaijan's security services. Columbia University has been deeply involved in Artsakh for the past years. We launched the Artsakh Atrocities Project in 2020 to document crimes in the conflict. In addition to the human toll, the recent blockade has set back prospects for peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Jake Sullivan, the US National Security Advisor, insists that Armenia and Azerbaijan resolve their differences through bilateral negotiations. But we know from experience the, the importance of international mediation and especially US engagement. To unpack these developments, our panel includes Ruben Vardanian, who is the state minister for Artsakh. After Ruben's presentation, we'll hear from Van Krikorian, co-chairman of the Armenian Assembly of America, and then we'll invite questions from you, the audience. Rather than a discussion about the facts, together we'll consider what can be done to deconflict and stabilize the situation. The panel will be recorded for redistribution. Ruben, let me give you the floor for your remarks. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone and say a uh, big thank you for organizing this uh, important event in Columbia University, which I admire, one of the best university in, uh, in the world. Um, also, I want to say thank you all the people who have been supporting us all these days. Um, and we felt this uh, emotional and not only emotional uh, support from political leaders, from ordinary people, from religion leaders and academician, everyone, and Armenian and non-Armenian people. And I will say it was very important for all of us who stay in blockade in um, Artsakh now to feel that we are not alone. I will be 
brief and I don't want to go in many, many details. I'm sure it will be a lot of questions and I will be delighted to answer to all these questions. But I want to say a few words about the situation, just describing for everyone who may be not so much familiar about uh, what's happened and why it's happened. First of all, I want to remind uh, everyone that 35 years ago, in February of 1988, there was movement of uh, <clears throat> Armenians who've been living in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, region was started. And from all these days, we've been asking to rights of self-determination and right for living in our homeland by our own rules. And uh, this uh, conflict, it's really a long history. I don't want to go into many details, but last two years after the um, November 9, 2020, we got new reality, which we've been living in, in a territory which has been surrounded around us entirely by Azerbaijan state. In December 12, Azerbaijan uh, names ecoactivists blockade the road, only one road which we had to the access to the Armenia to the world. And the main point which we raised, it was the we've been uh, concerned about the ecological situation in the mining uh, business which we've been developed by uh, dozens of years. And um, later it become clear what this is not about the uh, ecoactivism, but most of them been um, hired uh, by uh, Azerbaijan government and was confirmed by US journalists. You can get her report. And they've been also operated by uh, support by US Army. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Azerbaijan Army. And um, it's definitely create uh, pressure for Russian peacekeeper who have been stuck between this audience and who try to um, get into the uh, Stepanakir and Armenians who have been really stuck and will leave the place. Uh, 52 days we are already in a blockade. We got access from world only by Red Cross cars and uh, Russian peacekeepers who bring us a limited number of food and medicine. And by the way, when Azerbaijan state declared that we have a no blockade and said we had got during these 52 days, a couple hundred uh, trucks by which came by Russian peacekeepers or Red Cross, I just want to emphasize the number, but every day before the blockade, more of a thousand cars was getting get into Artsakh from outside, which means we got less uh, cars in during all 52 days compared to one day before. Also, I want to mention the story of separate families or the kids who've been uh, stuck outside of um, Artsakh. We got a couple hundred kids and a couple thousand people who couldn't come back to their home. And it took us six weeks or more to negotiate with the Red Cross and the Russian peacekeepers with the Azerbaijan side to allow these kids come back to the, their parents' home and they missed the New Year and Christmas Day. And um, unfortunately, despite all the negotiation, when the Russian peacekeeper bring the kids by bus to back to uh, Artsakh, they've been stopped by Azerbaijan side, they've been psychologically attacked by them, and they got big uh, psychological uh, crisis because of this uh, situation. And uh, they are teenagers, and it definitely was unacceptable from point of just any human. Uh, right, so we got also a situation with them, around 20 people died outside of Artsakh and we cannot bring the body of uh, people to Artsakh. For example, the mother uh, from Artsakh lost uh, her one son and uh, he, he was in the hospital and uh, we continue struggling to bring uh, him back to uh, Artsakh and uh, organize normal funeral. We got a situation with the German uh, husband with the Armenian Arab uh, wife, the free kids cannot leave place uh, because of the uh, Red Cross couldn't take them out. And this is showing again what this is all declaration that we don't have a blockade. It's not true. Additional to the blockade by road, we got uh, also uh, interrupted by electricity, which we provide from Armenia from January 9th. Azerbaijan government cannot fix the problem. It's showing maybe a very weak government. They don't have a very 
capacity to do my job because uh, 22 days we cannot fix this very simple uh, electricity problem, which means or we are uh, lying or we are really uh, don't want to fix the problem. We got oh, many days with gas was cut off or was supplied very few uh, small uh, volume of the gas and we got in the winter basically no schools, kids cannot go to the schools. And this is not only right for movement, and not only right for the uh, life, but also right for education is violated and right for the um, just basic human normal life. Yes, we have a food. We don't have, we don't we don't starve, and we got some food which we got by our reserves. We got some food which was uh, d delivered by a Russian peacekeeper. We got some medicament medicine from uh, Red Cross, but in the end, it's all under not normal conditions. Why? Right? For us, uh, it's a um, challenge is not only reflect and react to the current situation, but also understand this is, uh, if we go long term, it's a much more serious and much more deeper problem with electricity, with gas, with fuel, with water, for example, because in the spring we'll get <coughs> important element of agriculture work, uh, which needs to start in the, in the month time. And we have a serious issue about how we can organize this work for the people who live in uh, villages. Uh, I, uh, I hope you hear me well because our internet connection is not very stable and we had uh, just every two hours we cut off the electricity. So I, sorry it will be cut off just because it's a part of the reality we we're living now uh, every day. Um, but despite all these old challenges, I would say that Ruben Vardanyan, the person who moved here from September, I've been um, coming to Artsakh 20 years and I always feel, um, I was been amazed by people who live here, people who really so brave and so encouraged. And despite all these challenges, despite all the war and other things which happened with them, they continue to stay very strong and they continue to have an unbelievable resistance to defend their own rights to live in their own, home, their own homeland, their own, keep their own values, their own traditions. That's why. I will be also frank to say this uh, crisis uh, also create absolutely new um, atmosphere inside of Artsakh because people feel more um, connected to each other and they feel more um, uh, emotionally um, happy, not happy, but emotionally engaged with the situation, what we are feeling, what we are doing, something right for our own uh, kids and for new, in the next in the future generations. I want to say thank you for all the support we got also from Armenian Armenian government. It was um, not easy for them to be supportive to us, but we got um, uh, support for in many directions. And um, of course, the prime minister mentioned it's um, in his speech about uh, which is potential genocide that needs to be avoided. And uh, we got uh, legal support, all the, all the cases which was uh, applied in uh, Hag Tribunal or in the UN or other places, it was banned down by Armenia. And this is uh, very important to understand that in the end, it's uh, one nation who been together all these uh, years and we feel that we are not alone. Um, we also feel very good support from diaspora and every places which we are living in Russia, in France, and in the US. And I will say also, it's very important for us to get support from. Uh, three major countries uh, like Russia, US, France, and see what despite all the differences, uh, but now <laughs> they have uh, around the question about Ukraine. And here we have a common view. The story is not over. The story <clears throat> is important for the civilized world. And the story is not about ethnical conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijan. It's not about um, religion conflict. It's a conflict between democracy and autocracy because. Um, People realize we is a small uh, country like state uh, Artsakh. It's a uh, very uh, civilized, and during the last 35 years, we developed quite transparent democratic system. We had the four presidents. It was election. We had the opposition. We have uh, every element that you feel when you are coming here. When you have a, a civilized society, and um, of course, um, we had the issue uh, with the Azerbaijan state, which is control and managed by one family. And it's a very autocratic system, which we are not allowed to give any rights to 
the own people, not be talking about minorities, national, national minorities, but we have also. Also, I want to say it's a very important, but if you look at this ecological protests, um, uh, which was raised, we've been very clear about our response. We said we are no problem if international best expert will come and check our mining business, but also it will be a request to, which the same expert will check by same standards to um, mining business of other uh, in this region, which is belong to Azerbaijan state. The other point I always said it will be interesting for any academic researcher to check how many protests happened in Azerbaijan in the last 20 years around ecology issues and how many times any protest uh, went to the street in Azerbaijan and it was allowed by state to uh, raise their voice against something which happened in Azerbaijan. That's why when we look at the situation, it's not only a question about um, uh, the, the conflict between uh, Artsakh and Azerbaijan is an issue about key principles, how we have a right to live in our own homeland. We have our, with our own values, with the respect to the neighbor. And we said well, very clearly, we are ready for negotiation. We're ready for discussion. We're ready for a peace about it needs to be respected for both sides and needs to be respected for what we are on the side. And we, like I said in our formal, we will live side to side, but not under one uh, state uh, system, which is, of course, um, absolutely uh, was not a, uh, absolutely was unaccepted by uh, President Ali, who said we will prefer to have Artsakh without Armenians if we don't want to live under our own rules, which is create, of course, big challenge because uh, I think one of the key principles of self determination it's um, also to ethnic uh, <clears throat> people to live in our homeland with the thousand years we're living, and it's uh, also keep the democratic principles. I think it's three elements together create a big issue for how we can accept any offer from Azerbaijan to become part of a state. People ask me many times how we can help, and this is a very important element also. And I will say, um, of course, it's very important that we keep the interest uh, to the story of what's happened in Artsakh. And I'm very thankful to all the journalists. We got 40,000 stories was been written uh, and published and interviewed by many journalists around the world. And um, it was really amazing with the big interest uh, to the story of what's happening in Artsakh. Uh, we definitely believe it's keeping this pressure in uh, from public side will be very important. I also believe to make the clear position from the state uh, level, from the international organization, this is unacceptable from all point of view, it doesn't matter. Um, who is right, who is wrong. We don't want to discuss about any legal issue. It's a human rights violation, which is unacceptable for any standards. This is why I think to create this type of the pressure, this is, um, cannot be uh, accepted uh, and it will be not accepted by civilized world is very important. Also to create the potential sanctions against the people who are doing this because they're violating rights for the kids to have a very normal life. I think it's very important, I raised this many times, to get air corridor, which will be important for us to get access to humanitarian <coughs> goods to Artsakh without being dependent for the road, which is always can be controlled and closed by Azerbaijan. It's very important. And of course, I think the peacekeeper mandate needs to be incre increased and extended and became, become more um, <coughs> stronger because it was clear also with this situation with only 2,000 peacekeepers and with a with very limited mandate, it was not allowed to do a lot of things which we expected from Wayside. Um, of course, we understand the peacekeeper is a part of the bigger issue of the political decision needs to be taken by uh, international organization and big players. And of course, the key is uh, uh, Russia, France, and the United States, which I believe um, will find a way how we can cooperate and, and communicate and work together in this subject. Um, the last what I want to say, it's a privilege to live in Artsakh now for me, being person I've been doing this 20 years of my humanitarian activities in Artsakh, well, my grandmother was from here and I admire her, always her style of thinking and living and values because it was really different compared uh, my other family members and she came with very strong character. Um, I always felt that Artsakh is very unique and special. My son served army here and my daughter spent time here and I've been privileged doing more than 100 projects here. But now uh, with living together with these people, I feel 
but uh, it's uh, really give me a lot of energy and power to feel that I'm doing something important, uh, not only for myself or for my own uh, nation, but it's also for the world to keeping this democratic, small, um, old nation in a state and tradition the way what needs to be kept for the, not only for us, but for the world also. Thank you. Ruben, thanks for, thanks for those remarks. You talked about feeling alone, well, you're not alone. We're in solidarity with you and the people of Artsakh. I also want you to know that there were 579 people who registered for this webinar, which is a record for Columbia University. So tell the Armenians of Artsakh that we stand in solidarity with them and we appreciate your interventions and your remarks. Now we're going to turn to Van Kokorian, who is the co-chairman of the Armenian Assembly of America. We're going to think together a little bit about how to represent Artsakh's interests in the United States, and no more effective organization than the Assembly for that purpose, and no greater advocate than Mr. Kokorian. So the floor is yours now, Van. David, that was very gracious of you. I feel a little bit humbled to be here with with you and State Minister Vartanian, considering all that, that you've done, as well as all of the other people and organizations that I know are on this call. Um, so a, a senator from Vermont who used to famously say, I only regret my parents could not be here to hear that kind of an introduction because my mother would have, uh, my father would have enjoyed it and my mother might have believed it. What I want to focus on quickly, and I'm going to keep my comments brief so that we'll have time for uh, questions and answers, is that the intent of Azerbaijan to commit genocide here has been well established over the years. And I think if the problem is viewed in that context, it becomes a lot easier to understand, as well as to dismiss a lot of the specious arguments that Azerbaijan is making, some of which unfortunately focus on State Minister Vartanian and false allegations against him, some of which uh, focus on this sort of what's been called both siderism, you know, that this is uh, both sides are doing the same things to each other, so nobody should pay attention. Um, some of which focus on faulty historical issues, but most of which revolve around absolute corruption, which is endemic to the Aliyev regime and is participated in by companies like British Petroleum and Anglo-Asian Mining and public relations firms and so many others, which the lists have been compiled. Here, unlike in a lot of other genocidal situations, we have a very clear record going back many, many years and established with corresponding acts that the intent of the Azerbaijani regime is to eliminate the army, to solve the Nagorno, what they consider the Nagorno-Karabakh problem by eliminating the Armenians. Let me read some quotes that go back many years, all from government officials. Our goal is the complete elimination of the Armenians. This was a quote given by the mayor of Baku to a visiting German delegation. You Nazis already eliminated the Jews in the 1930s and 1940s, right? You should be able to understand that. Another quote, within the next 25 years, there will be no state of Armenia in the South Caucasus. These people have no right to live in the region. Modern Armenia was built on historical Azerbaijani lands. I think that in 25 to 30 years, its territory will again come under Azerbaijan's jurisdiction. It was from their defense minister in 2004. Armenia is not even a colony. It is not even worthy of being a servant. That was from President Aliyev in 2015. We must kill all Armenians, children, women, and the elderly. We need to kill them without making a distinction. No regrets, no compassion. That was from 2020. 
2018, the current president of Azerbaijan spoke before his party conference and said, I should also mention that we should not forget our historical lands and we do not forget them. This should be the direction for our future activity. Just as we are working in this direction today, our historical lands are Yerevan, Zangezur, Ocha, which is Lake Sevan. The young generation and the world should know this. Yerevan is our historical land and we Azerbaijanis must return to these historical lands. This is our political and strategic goal and we must gradually approach this goal. So those are chilling words. And, and, and that's not all. Compiled files and files. And this is just what they say in public. Imagine what they say in closed circles. We were very fortunate in a sense, in a perverse sense, that on a flight with President Erdogan of Turkey, his wife and President Aliyev, President Erdogan's wife was recorded, video recorded, advising Aliyev not to let the prisoners of war from the 2020 war go, to continue holding them as bargaining chips, even though the November 2020 tripartite statement establishing the ceasefire said that they should be all released. There's piles and piles of evidence on genocidal intent, which is usually the hardest thing to prove in these types of situations. And this is not just empty rhetoric. As both speakers before me and Senator Van Hollen noted, this is not just a blockade of the five kilometer wide Lachin corridor that's supposed to be open for all traffic between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. This is a cutting off of the gas supplies, a lot of which began before State Minister Vartanian arrived here. This is the cutting off of electricity for so long without even giving the Armenian company the right to go and, and fix it. This is the cutting off of internet. And increasingly, and again, well, well before State Minister Vartanian showed up, well, well before the most recent round of fabricated excuses, the water resources were cut off. The eco-protesters are not eco-protesters. They are security service employees and related to the Aliyev clan in various ways. They have official capacities. In terms of things to do, I'm glad to say that within the coming days, members of the House of Representatives at least will be introducing legislation to sanction the officials responsible for that, as well as the others responsible for uh, what's going on in this attempted at genocide. When it comes to the Aliyev clan, I also want to go back a bit in history because I, I view this as something that people forget and need to understand. The Aliyev family has been ruling Azerbaijan for many, many years, decades. In 1991, David Remnick published his uh, monumental work, Lenin's Tomb, about breakup of the Soviet Union. And let me read what he wrote about Aliyev's father, Haidar Aliyev. When he was a young man, Aliyev's ambitions were almost derailed when he was accused of sexual assault. He avoided expulsion from the party by a single vote at his disciplinary hearing. There were, of course, no further legal proceedings. The party's judgment was all. As the KGB chief, Aliyev launched a campaign against corruption only to purge his enemies and elevate himself and his clan, and he succeeded spectacularly. Aliyev ruled Azerbaijan as surely as the Gambino family ran the port of New York. And it lists a number of mafias even then that they controlled. Aliyev even practiced hegemony over the intellectual life of Azerbaijan. 
He appointed his relatives chairman of various institutes, academic departments, enabling them in turn to charge tens of thousands to scholars in search of meaningful employment. And when we look at genocidal situations, not even genocidal situations, but situations that call for a meaningful peace agreement, we have to look at whether the leaders are preparing their people for peace or for more war. Here again, the record is perfectly clear that the president of Azerbaijan and his partner, President Erdogan, are preparing the people of Azerbaijan for more war. The post-war uh, absolute racist museum that they constructed depicting Armenians, the education that they've given their children over the last generations has been pure racism. It cannot be against racism in other parts of the world and not and turn a blind eye to the racism that's being exhibited here, regardless of companies' profit margins. I know I'm going a little bit long, but when it comes to genocide, one of the other things that's important to the world was important to the world when the Taliban destroyed the Bamyan Buddhas. It's important around the world to preserve cultural heritage. And I'm hoping that that we can post the Columbia University site on atrocities because they include an excellent section on the cultural genocide that's going on. But the newfound concern about environment is really bogus. There are no demonstrations against the oil industries that have polluted Azerbaijan. And by contrast, this Anglo-Asian company, Anglo-Asian mining company, actually marketed its ability to mine around an Armenian church, Dadivank church, centuries old uh, cultural monument. The priests that are there are doing heroic work. They're completely isolated. They're captives in that monastery. The destruction that's been documented of other sites, including during the Soviet period, is remarkable. And thanks to a study done by Cornell University shows how in Nakichevan, 90%, I think, of the monuments were, were destroyed, not just during Soviet time, but post-Soviet time. It is exactly what everybody is supposed to be against. And we're watching it happen. I'm going to uh, pause here so that we'll have some time for questions and answers um, and hope that I've been helpful. Pam, thank you very much. Your intervention was very helpful. Some of the quotes that you shared with us are just chilling uh, in their racism and hatefulness. I'm also glad that you mentioned prisoners of war. We've campaigned extensively for their release, which is called for in the tripartite agreement of 2020. There are still POWs being held, and we want a full and complete accounting. So let me um, retrieve some of the questions from our audience. I have to say that we, we've been inundated with questions, including some interventions by bots and pro-Azerbaijani spokespersons and propagandists. But let me see if I can separate the wheat from the chaff and focus on uh, questions that lend themselves to a meaningful discussion. Uh, let's talk about the 2020 tripartite statement. Uh, Mr. Vardanyan, is it legally governing relations between Baku, Yerevan, and Moscow? And for how long is that statement valid? We believe this is the legal document, which we have been living last two years. We believe this is a very important document, which we rely to the day-by-day -day life. And uh, we believe it's nobody has a right to cancel this document. Uh, 
from one side needs to be uh, kept like the key document for uh, continuity of the living people in Arta. David, could I add a point there? I, I, I thank State Minister for that comment. I, and I think that's generally the Armenian and Russian position uh, and Artsakh's position as well. But I'd also know, and I think uh, many of the people in this call have been, been watching the ICJ proceedings going on at The Hague, where you know the lawyers for Azerbaijan appear almost comical uh, in terms of the factual arguments they're making. But one thing is also clear, that, that a line of contact was established and clear lines of contact were established, implying clearly that Artsakh would have the right to defend itself also. That's very important, I think, that, that they have the right to defend themselves because they are in such a remote area. And I'd hope that that's something the United States and other countries would defend. Thank you, Juan, yeah. Uh, Ruben, maybe you can amplify Van's comment. Uh, are there Artsakh self-defense forces deployed? Is there a line of contact separating them from Azeri forces? And how is that arrangement called for in the 2020 statement working? Yeah, <clears throat> one said absolutely correctly what we've been surrounded by um, Azerbaijan state and we have a right to our self-defense and we've been always um, in defense position to our own homes, our own families, our own kids. And um, unfortunately, again, it's all been provoked by Azerbaijan side every day from November 9th. We got many times with the, we not allowed the farmers to do their work in the land. We've been uh, shooting uh, people just because we were some I know bad mood or whatever, we just uh, behave in the way which is create more pressure to the ordinary people to leave place. This is why, of course, we believe we have a right to our own self-defense and uh, which we are trying to develop by bringing everybody with understanding of the importance of defending our own homeland, our own motherland. A remnant of, a remnant of violent conflict are residual landmines and cluster bombs. What's the status of efforts to clear landmines and cluster bombs from the 2020 war and before? Look, it's a, it's a serious um, uh, issue for every civilized, civilized uh, people who have been doing their work in um, land. And we got um, <clears throat> a lot of challenges and we stories which um unfortunately hurt some people but they held a trust and um especially the entire center worked uh, worked very hard to make the cleanup as much we can the mining uh, which been put in the land and um again this is the something which we believe uh, needs to be organized with the russian peacekeepers and organized the international help by organizations like hello trust to make the clean the land as soon as possible for everyone Let's talk for a moment about food insecurity. Uh, blocking the Lachin corridor has made the delivery of food and medical supplies extremely difficult. What's the physical and psychological impact of these shortages on the local population? Look, it's, it's tough because the kids, for example, don't understand why we couldn't have normal fruits. The kids cannot understand why we cannot have a normal I know, sneakers, for example. It's, it's, it's an elementary thing that the, 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 the these boy and girls uh, cannot uh, get, which we have, been, uh, we have access before. And it's creates some issues, it creates some problem, depression, and people, of course, um, very psychologically vulnerable about what's happening with them and their kids, especially. At the same time, people said, okay, this is life. We can stay and keep ourselves uh, alive and we can provide. We now put the coupon system, which allow people to get some basic food by uh, distribution from the government, which is stabilized situation from basic food, but it's not, it's not the sole issue about something which 
you have a normal ration when you are in a normal place, normal life. That's why the food um, problem is not only about do we have enough calories, but it's also what kind of the type of the food you can get now in uh, Artsakh. And it's not um, the right level, absolutely. Tell us a little a little bit about shortages of electricity and fuel. Is that a problem? Cool. It's a big problem. For example, every day we've been cut off six hours a day. Because we've been 12 hours a day before we give it gas. And it's uh, unfortunate we are using the water, which is uh, very critical for our agriculture work because we're using the our natural resources, resource of the water resource in uh, Artsakh and um, just get some electricity because we cut off the lines from Armenia and we couldn't get any electricity from Armenia. That's so why, yes, it's a quite uh, critical, especially for the schools, for example, we, you know, uh, we don't have kindergartens now operating. We don't have a, most of the school operating because we cannot get the gas uh, in a, always say the, the volume which is necessary for them to be operating and provide the uh, right temperature. We couldn't provide the kindergarten because the kids cannot get food uh, enough to be all day in a kindergarten. And this means the, the, the mothers need to stay at home. Entire economy in a, in a collapse because we cannot get a lot of production and producers cannot produce anything and supply demand chain, everything is collapsed. That's why you won't realize it's not only a question about the food and, and, and the water or gas. It's it's a it's entire economy, entire life of the people who will be living in this place uh, stopped now and it's uh, fully destroyed. What's the motive here? Is it simply to inflict misery or is there an agenda to depopulate Artsakh of its Armenian population? Look, I think the President Aliyev said very clearly, we see Artsakh without Armenians. If we probably don't want to live under our rules, we need to leave the place. That's why ethnic cleansing is, is it's a, it's a goal that uh, the regime publicly declared. I don't see it's, it's not a secret that it is publicly. So Azerbaijan is pursuing a policy of ethnic cleansing. Is that right? Absolutely, I believe we are. We have a, no issue. We cannot. We said we will not offer any. Think to Armenians who live in Artsakh, we don't see you like any community. You are like one of the, our citizens, and uh, this is something which um, was rejected from first day uh, when we talk about any type of the dialogue between Azerbaijan and Artsakh. And, uh, they try to put the, their own rules, their own system under which we we need to be living. It's absolutely yeah, it's clear, but they want to. Uh, Armenians uh, will leave this place and will not stay in our homeland, which we've been living for thousands of years. So the challenges that you've described um, seem pretty insurmountable. They constitute relentless pressure by Azerbaijan on the Armenians of Artsakh. How have you maintained the hope for Artsakh Armenians that they can survive this blockade? and that things will be better in the future. Look, like I said, in um, I'm, I'm privileged to meet these people. I've been, I, I, I was traveling around the villages last uh, couple of weeks and I met a lot of people in the different villages and they all said the same. We are strong. We've been uh, living in the same conditions in the 90s when the Azerbaijan started the first war. And by the way, people don't realize, but the first war was started in 1989 and 1990 by from Azerbaijan, Soviet Republic. And they tried to do ethnic cleansing, but like we did in Shaomian and other places, which was part of the Armenian community that been living in Azerbaijan, Soviet Republic. So my people have a very strong resistance. They have a strong courage to defend their own homeland. I met yesterday the, the special, it's a mother's, uh, club where it includes 10,000 young mothers which have babies uh, before five years old. And you know, it was uh, amazing to meet 10 women which been representing this um, 10,000 mothers. And they talk about how they can help their husbands to defend the country, how what they can do in a situation to provide good education to the kids. They talk about, not about how escape from here, but how we can be 
part of the future of this uh, place. It's just amazing, to be honest. Every time I met these people, I felt so emotionally encouraged, so emotionally in touch with, and it's just very ordinary people. It's again, they all believe this is the only way we can live. They believe this is their own hand, or homeland, their own uh, place. We've been living for thousands of years by their heritage, by their previous generations. And they see the future to be, despite all the challenges, despite all the problems, but we will stay and we will live here and continue. So given the steady stream of anti-Armenian propaganda and the racist messages coming from Baku, uh, is there something that you want to convey to ordinary Azerbaijani people who don't want to be complicit in the crimes committed by their government? Look, the, we all know the any war brings a lot of uh, victims and um, unfortunately people die from both sides and a lot of thousands of people die in Azerbaijan side and I always said it's um, clear with Azerbaijan state uh, Azerbaijan regime of one family tried to keep this armenophobia just to keep a power because inside of the country we have no democracy inside of the country we have no human rights inside of the country we have no normal uh, civilized society by the way Per revenue per person, Armenians have a better number compared to Azerbaijan, despite the oil and gas. I think you saw the last scandal with the OCRP about how the small number of the rich Azerbaijani government officials took billions of dollars out of the country. So I, it's um, something which we all need to understand, uh, to make the stop the war. You know, I got the price. Uh, for common ground, this organization which was established in the United States in after the Vietnamese War, and it's a very major mandate to try to bring uh, people who after war needs to come and try to talk to each other, um, <clears throat> bring the basis for decreased the hatefulness, decrease the emotional negativity. But for this, needs to be <clears throat> understand one thing: is pandemic, pandemic, which going back and forth. If you're going pressure now to the strong, try to make the ethnic cleansing to. Armenians will get back the same uh, way back to you. So by the only way you can stop understand this is no make sense for ordinary Azerbaijani people to continue this, uh, this war. Because it's again, it's land which we, Armenians have been living always. It's a land where is uh, our historical heritage and monasteries and um, everything in the ordinary life been established by Armenians. And before, uh, by the way, this uh, region become part of Azerbaijan a republic is 90% was Armenians who has been living here. Like the same, like in Nahichevan, by the way, where it was now zero Armenians live. And this is the story which people always need to remember. This is the, the other region which now fully have zero Armenians. And I don't think they have benefit anything from getting uh, one more piece of the land uh, without understanding why we're giving the lives of their sons. And, um, you know, um, February is a horrible month because um, Everything started in uh, uh, Sumgait in Baku, January. And people asked me about, do I see any chance any day with will of peace? And I said, you know, I have a dream, which I really believe it's the only way we can find a solution to this strategy is uh, when two mothers who lost their sons will go together to the both places in, Ye in Yerevan, Yerav, Yerablur, and in, in Baku. And, and cry at the same time to take, uh, understand that they need to pass away this tragedy and go for the future of the, the grandsons and grandkids who couldn't see their fathers because they've been killed in, our, in the war. But the only way you can do it if you're crossing this line of hateness to get something is more important is uh, human uh, values and human lives and human being human. And this is been tough for both sides, but right? I'm a believer but one day we'll do this, and I believe this is only one way we can cross this strategy which happened between two nations been living together hundreds of years. Again, it's, uh, we have a lot of good things. It's again, people don't forget we've been neighbors, we had a marriage, uh, mixed marriage, we had the kids, we had a lot of friends. I've been in my company, for example, Trocadalk in Moscow, I had four or five Azerbaijani work for in our company and become the partners and there was no problem. So I, I see the potential for this. I see we need to put a lot of efforts. We need to explain for Azerbaijan people that it doesn't make sense to keep this uh, external enemy like Armenians 
to keep the power of one family inside of the Winston Cross is um, difficult, but a very important um, line of hatredness. Ruben, you, you're aware that I've worked extensively on track two activities, dialogue projects between Armenians and people from Azerbaijan, uh, trying to promote contact, communication, and cooperation. I can say it's extremely difficult for civil society to engage when the government in Baku actively opposes that. But I do really welcome your suggestion about it, mothers and engaging them uh, in a peace process. Uh, mothers represent a moral force. They have direct involvement because of their suffering and the losses they've experienced. And Columbia University looks forward to engaging with civil society representatives in both countries so that we can identify ways of working together towards mutual benefit. We're almost at the end of our panel, so let's hear first from Van a concluding statement, and then we'll go back to you. Thank you. And, you know, I think with the odds so far stacked against this concept of bringing light to what's actually going on is so important. Sunshine in this case is a big part of the disinfectant and fixing the evils that are going on. We are, you know, we in the United States and around the world were shocked when we saw George Floyd get strangled to death, to death. And the same with Tyree Nichols. And those of us who have been in the human rights world for so long are always shocked when you know, we can feel a crisis coming and then see it happen and are frustrated that it can't be stopped. But we're at one of those points again. The idea of unfettered access between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh is not anything except normal. It's nothing that anyone, any person of good faith should be against under any circumstances, certainly not in the circumstances that Azerbaijan and its agents are promoting. Not only is our members of Congress introducing this legislation soon that will call for sanctions on those people but the idea of enforcing Section 907 of the United States sending direct humanitarian assistance there is something I think that all Americans would be in favor of, uh, not in favor of turning a blind eye to. And I, I would hope that people of good faith in different countries would feel the same way also. I, I really thank David, I thank Senator Van Hollen and, um, and State Minister Bartanian. God be with you. Ruben? I will be very short. I just want to say thank you for everyone to really being with us. And um, I have a privilege to live with the people who make me happy because despite all the challenges, all the difficulties, I can see what it means when you have a society which share the values, share the importance of the past but ready for fight for the future. And I believe this is very important. We are ready for do everything possible to have a bright future for our next generations, which you believe is to grow up like Armenians. So we'll be proud to be part of the world and give the world the knowledge, the experience, the uh, commitment to make the world better. Because what we learn here is a fight between David and Holyoff. The David is always right because despite being small and maybe not always uh, being big, um, it's uh, values which give you so much power to win the battle between David and Holy Office. That's why I believe it's always been our side, the world will be in our side. Thank you. Well, in the introduction, I mentioned that we were gonna focus on practical recommendations and we've received a number of them in, uh, in the chat room. So let me just summarize a few of them. Uh, one participant urges the Biden administration to rescind the waiver of Section 907 of the Freedom Support Act until Azerbaijan lifts its blockade. Another suggests that the Minsk group intensify its mediation and that representatives of Nagorno-Karabakh of Artsakh should be included. 
We have another recommendation to deploy international monitors to Artsakh as witnesses to Azerbaijan's aggression and to escort humanitarian convoys. Another participant calls on economic and diplomatic sanctions imposed on Azerbaijan to punish its aggression. Uh, we have 99 questions in the queue. I've tried to capture many of them. Uh, let me just say a word of thanks to our panelists, to Minister Ruben Vardanian for his effective work representing the people of Artsakh, to Van Kukorian, who is the voice of Armenian advocacy uh, in Washington. I also want to thank Chris Van Hollen for joining our panel earlier today. And one of the lessons that we draw from these abuses is that people who are victimized are interconnected. So today is the second year anniversary of the military coup in Myanmar and Burma. So I want to express solidarity with the people of Burma and our hope that they will enjoy greater rights and democratic participation in the future. Those same wishes are extended to Armenians in Artsakh and to all of our panelists and participants. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining. And with that, we'll adjourn the discussion. So thank you all and have a good day.